In this lecture, we will look at how marine ecosystems react to human pressure. And uh, we will learn what factors help ecosystems resist human pressure. That's also called the resilience of a system. And we will learn how evolutionary adaptation may mitigate negative effects of human pressures. And uh, <clears throat> finally, when pressures are exceeded, then a very important concept are alternative states that let ecosystem flip into a completely different status that is very difficult to get back out again. Let us have a look at two of the most important human pressures uh, that are affecting marine ecosystems worldwide. One is nutrient pollution. So why is nutrient pollution such a problem? Uh, normally nutrients are quite limited in marine systems and if you put in excess nutrients then particular sorts of plants, uh, very weedy, fast-growing algae will overgrow coastal macrophytes, in particular seagrasses and macroalgae. And that's bad because those macrophytes have a very important role in marine ecosystems as carbon and nutrient storage. So how can ecosystems buffer against being overgrown by the ephemeral weedy algae so that the macrophyte bed would, uh, would be killed. So one very effective mechanism is actually biological. It's based on biological interaction and it involves little small grazers, tiny snails and also crustaceans that graze the leaves of our macrophytes free of those epiphytic algae. And they do that for free. And, of course, a diverse and redundant, rich species community of those grazers is very favorable to the existence of macrophyte beds. Example number two, where ecosystems are obviously perfectly working with the human pressure, is fisheries in medieval and also historic times, when the fisheries methods weren't as effective yet. And so we can see from archaeological remains of settlements uh, of, the, uh, of the late uh, Stone Age that uh, for a very long uh, time there was a rich and abundant uh, seafood fl uh, flora. And still in medieval times, as you can see uh, from, uh, from this painting, the table in the European seas was richly uh, full of diverse marine seafood. Now we turn over to modern times and human population has multiplied and the pressures have multiplied. So one very prominent example for overharvesting via fisheries is the Scotian shelf uh, off the coast of Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. There are very, very rich cod and other ground fish um, populations uh, have been completely fished towards near ecological extinction. So the biomass has gone down to about 5% of the levels at the beginning of the 20th century. And that led to a cascading effect throughout the entire food chain. So the food chain has changed from a large predatory fish, ground fish dominated food chain where cod and other large ground fish had the control over their prey and over crustaceans as benthic food to a system that's now dominated by small pelagic fish um, and by crustaceans and very little of the large predatory ground fish. And there are also now self-sustaining processes that keep the system in exactly that state, which are that the small pelagic fish feed on the few remaining fish eggs that the large ground fish spawn. So there's a self-reinforcing uh, cycle that keeps the system now in the small pelagic fish slash crustacean dominated state. A second example <clears throat> I would like to present about these other ecosystem states is a coastal one. So we have uh, along the temperate coasts <clears throat> of North America, we have these lush cat forests as one state and we have barren grounds dominated by sea urchins as a second state. In this example, the key role that mediates the flip back and forth between those two ecosystem states are these cute sea otters that are the main predators of the sea urchins. And whenever sea otters are rare, get hunted down, die of disease, or are recently uh, fed by orcas, aka killer whales, then the sea urchins explode 
and they then themselves overgraze the kelp to such an extent that the kelp forest gets totally lost and is replaced by a barren ground. So here again, human influence <coughs> indirectly or directly on the sea otter triggers a complete reconfiguration of the system. These two examples tell you that there are lots of nonlinearities in biological systems, that there are thresholds. Once those are exceeded, then the system very quickly uh, shifts to a different system. A nice conceptual model uh, for those two alternative states is this picture here where you see a ball that's representing our ecosystem state. First in the valley A, that would be our desired or natural ecosystem state. Um, and <clears throat> then to varying degrees the system can be resilient or less resilient, so we make this valley either more shallow or deeper. And so once symbolized here by the black arrow, we have our perturbation either by harvesting um, or by <clears throat> decimating the sea otters, then the system, the ball, can go over uh, our little bump here and roll into the second valley where then the, state is, um, the status of the ecosystem is self-stabilizing through these feedback loops. Um, and it's very difficult to get back to our desired original ecosystem state. An important man management implication is that we need to quantify those level of perturbation, for example, in terms of nutrient pollution or over-harvesting, that a system can still tolerate until it flips uh, into another state. What now makes systems be more or less resilient so our valley deeper uh, or shallower? So many experiments have shown, including in marine systems, that species diversity makes systems more resilient. But also we are now increasingly see that genetic diversity within species is important for resilience and also for evolutionary adaptation. So let's first look at the species diversity versus genetic diversity. So it has always puzzled researchers in recent years that uh, many macrophyte beds in wetlands and also in shallow coastal areas are actually monospecific. So in terms of species diversity, there's none. There's only one dominant algae or one dominant seagrass. So the hypothesis then came up, okay, so maybe it's the diversity within the species that's very important to keep the productivity and the stability of those systems. And that's exactly what came out of the following experiment. So via diving, researchers were directly manipulating the genetic diversity of seagrass beds, and then they were following them in terms of biomass and productivity and stability through time in the field. And in line with the hypothesis that diversity is good, and here, genetic diversity, they found um, that through an extreme stress event, a very strong heat wave, but also in normal years, there was indeed a higher productivity in the diverse uh, experimentally assembled uh, plots, uh, and also the associated fauna was more diverse in the diverse plots. So again, we see that diversity enhances stability and productivity of marine systems. Let's now turn <clears throat> to the next step that would be the change in terms of evolutionary adaptation to novel conditions. Phytoplankton algae were exposed in a series of experiments to either ocean acidification or ocean warming uh, in little bottles that basically represent the organisms of tomorrow in the laboratory of today. And what we can see from those experiments is a nugget of hope. We can see that at least some phytoplankton species, here coccolithophores of the species Emiliania huxleyi, they can both adapt within a time frame of a year or so, both to acidification <coughs> and to ocean warming by means of evolutionary adaptation. Also here, it could be that there are at least some species that can adapt to a changing environment. And the big question now is, is this fast enough and which species can adapt and which cannot? And why is that so? What are the management implications? They are at least twofold. Uh, 
So one is that we should enhance species diversity or protect species diversity wherever we can. Since there is no firm experimental evidence that species diversity helps maintaining ecosystem stability and productivity. And secondly, management programs now also need to incorporate other levels of diversity, uh, in particular genetic diversity. So in most management programs, the uh, maintenance of genetic diversity as a prerequisite for adaptive evolution and also enhancing stability is not considered. So this is a very important next step to have an integrated view of biodiversity in uh, ocean uh, management programs.